Hello and welcome to our first lecture proper on the topic of Middle Egyptian and hieroglyphics. Now before we can really get into the actual language, we need to know a little bit of historical context just so we can place some of the examples and that kind of thing in their proper context and you can know where Middle Egyptian stands relative to other forms of the language. Egyptologists conventionally divide Egyptian history into a number of periods. It's quite long, and so this makes it much easier to discuss. First, you have pre-dynastic Egypt, which runs from about 6,000 BCE, which is the start of when agriculture was going on, to 3,000 BCE. Early dynastic Egypt, between 3100 and 2686 BCE. The Old Kingdom, between 2686 and 2181 BCE. The first intermediate period, 2181 to 2055, then from there the Middle Kingdom ran until 1650. The second intermediate period, another 100 years to about 1550. 1550 to 1069 BCE was the New Kingdom, and then the third intermediate and late periods, uh, which can kind of be grouped together, run from 1069 to 332 BCE. After that, you have Ptolemaic Egypt, when Egypt was under Greek rule as an independent state, and then it was ultimately absorbed into the Roman Empire around the turn into CE. Note that these dates are somewhat approximate and certainly subject to change depending on what author you go off of. Uh, the subject of ancient Near Eastern chronology prior to about 700 BCE is very much an unsolved topic. There's a lot of missing references and that kind of thing, so it can be hard to put together a calendar. These dates for periodization are what you'll find on Wikipedia. They're perfectly serviceable, but there is some debate about exact dates, which is why you should always be cautious about using them in any historical source for something going back this far. Pre-dynastic Egypt was the period where Egypt developed from Neolithic villages, the kind of thing that was going on in many areas of the world at the time, into a proper state, a kingdom. Early on, you had the slow developmental patterns of the Neolithic. You had you know, your villages, small gatherings, like maybe 100 people practicing basic animal and plant agriculture. These coalesced very slowly. They got larger over time. A few centers developed, places like Nekan in the south and Buto in the north. In the end, there seems to have been some conflict. Uh, art like the Narmer palette and the scorpion mace depict a period of warfare between rival proto-kingdoms. We don't know a ton about it because this was before the development of writing. The very first inklings of hieroglyphics begin to come from this period, but it's hard to distinguish them as true writing rather than just symbols of individuals and that kind of thing. Um, so we, do, we don't know a lot about it. It is a very active area of archaeological research. Suffice it to say, at the end of this period, there emerged a single kingdom of Egypt. Once Egypt proper is founded, traditionally attributed to a king named Menes, who might be uh, fictional, who might be the same person as the actual historical figure known as Narmer. Uh, there, again, it's a little shrouded in mystery. Egypt became a, a true kingdom, uh, a, a real large state, one of the first to develop in the world, predating China actually by a couple hundred years and up only a hundred years after the development of uh, a real state of uh, Uruk, as I, as I remember it at least. Uruk may have been earlier, but that's besides the point. The first writing developed during this period. We go from a couple of symbols that might represent individuals to the beginnings of a proper literary system. The early dynastic period is divided into two dynasties. The first dynasty was a group of kings who ruled over a, a pretty stable and functional kingdom. Uh, the second dynasty seems to have coincided with some environmental upheaval and other issues, and it's, it was a little chaotic. Again, we don't know a lot because this is when writing was developing, but before kings were really making like lots of records of what they were doing, uh, the monuments were not quite so large or impressive as in later periods. They did not survive so well, that kind of thing. The Old Kingdom is what you probably think of when you think of ancient Egypt, unless you recently watched the Ten Commandments or something like that and end up thinking of the New Kingdom. We'll get to that later. This is the Pyramid Age. This is the time when 
Egypt took all of the vast resources of the country, and they are vast, and devoted them to the creation of these incredible monuments. Uh, the Great Pyramids of Giza are unsurpassed in terms of longevity and scale among ancient monuments. The temples during this period were equally impressive, if a little smaller. Uh, and while only a few kings built pyramids on that scale, there were many, many important pyramid and temple complexes. Uh, it was kind of an introspective period. The, Egypt did engage in foreign trade and warfare and that kind of thing, but compared to the Middle and New Kingdoms, there was very, very little. Egypt was mostly focused on itself and its immediate environs for ex exploitation. Uh, religion seems to have developed into the form that we know it as during this period. The association of Horus with the king took place very early on in Egyptian history. This is the period when he was also associated with the sun god, which is the other main royal association. Uh, kingship takes on its modern form. The royal name, which we'll get to later, becomes standardized. The Egyptian bureaucracy forms, which is a very important part of understanding how ancient Egypt functioned. This is when Egypt becomes what we know it as. Uh, you know, the, all the basic tropes of Egyptian society come into being. The Old Kingdom lasts about 500 years, but eventually comes to an end with the First Intermediate Period. The First Intermediate Period, we don't really know what brought it about. It's possible that it was brought about by climactic issues, uh, by drought and that kind of thing. Uh, it may, one, one amusing story is that the last king of the Old Kingdom, who may have ruled for 94 years, he might also have ruled for 48, it's hard to establish chronology, or, yeah, may have ruled for 97 then, I guess, uh, was a ruler for so long that no one really knew what to do when he died, uh, all succession plans having long since gone out the window. In any case, the country fractures, splits into pieces. In the first half, there seems to have been a pharaoh that everybody pretended to recognize at the capital at Memphis. In the second half, it just became an open, all-out civil war between local nobles. We actually have a good number of records from this. A bunch of those local nobles left behind Stila, detailing their victories over one another and that kind of thing. I've encountered a few of them in my thesis work. But even still, this is not like a period where we're getting a lot of art and tomb monuments and that kind of thing. We don't have a really good record like we do of the Old Kingdom. So that's why we call it an intermediate period. It's between the periods that we understand very well. Eventually, one of those local nobles, a guy named Manchuhotep II, ends up reuniting Egypt. And he founds a, what is treated as a continuation of the Old Kingdom by himself and his contemporaries, but which is functionally a new state, the Middle Kingdom. This is the beginning of Egyptian imperialism. The Egyptians in the Old Kingdom would occasionally like go out and beat up some nomads and take all of their stuff. But this is when the Egyptians start like actually annexing non-Egyptian land and that kind of thing. They build a whole bunch of fortresses in Nubia, control those trade routes and, and mining colonies and that kind of thing. Uh, this is also a period of a great flowering of literature. A lot of the most famous stories of ancient Egypt were all written down originally in the Middle Kingdom. Many of the wisdom texts, the famous story of Sinui, the story of the shipwrecked sailor, all originally Middle Kingdom compositions. Uh, this is why, by the way, we study Middle Egyptian. Uh, Middle Egyptian is the language of the Middle Kingdom, fittingly enough. And because so much interesting literature has been written in Middle Egyptian, that is a, one of the major reasons that we choose that particular version of the language to study as the primary version and what is taught to beginners in Egyptology. Unfortunately, the Middle Kingdom isn't really well known in popular culture. You know, if, you, if I were to say the name Khufu, as I assume anyone listening to this is something of an enthusiast in Egyptian history, you'd probably be able to recognize that immediately. Khufu, Khafre, uh, Djoser, those types in the Old Kingdom. In the New Kingdom, you have your Ramses, your Tutmos, your Hatshepsuts. But the Middle Kingdom, with, with great kings and Wazrit and Amenemhat, you don't, you don't hear those names nearly as often, which is very unfortunate. The Middle Kingdom collapses too. Like the Old Kingdom, the collapse was slow and then all at once. 
Uh, it seems like what happened, among other things, is a reduction in central authority and the migration of Semitic peoples in large quantities into the Delta. Eventually, these Semitic peoples just found their own state. As the power of the central government wanes, they feel the need to take matters in their own hands. So there's several different people claiming to be pharaoh at once because you have you know, Semitic peoples, you have Egyptian vassals of the Semitic kingdom, and you have independent Egyptian rulers in the far south of Thebes. Uh, it's a period of a lot of division and warfare. Eventually, the Thebans come out on top after after several several civil wars, uh, and it is reunified by what we, what comes to be known as the 18th Dynasty. Uh, the 18th Dynasty, as well as the two following dynasties, the two following generally went lumped together as the Ramesside period, after all the guys named Ramses, who ruled during their was 1 through 11, uh, this ran the New Kingdom, which was a period of ex imperialism and expansionism and diplomacy. It is very well recorded. It is much better recorded than the other two periods. The Middle Kingdom is when a lot of literature was written, but most of it comes down to us on New Kingdom copies uh, and papyri from that period. Uh, the annals of the kings are well known during this period. Uh, we actually have a whole collection of diplomatic letters between the Egyptian monarchs and their vassal states in Syria and their allies and enemies around the world. The, the previous two Egyptian states had never really had to contend with other nations on the same scale as Egypt, and the New Kingdom did. The Hittites, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Mitanni, all posed a threat to Egypt, so you end up with a very warlike kingdom kind of in response to that. The Third Intermediate Period, again, is a, just a slow, steady collapse during the 20th Dynasty, eventually leading to uh, Egypt's division into a couple of different kingdoms. There's nominally a pharaoh, but local priests have a lot of power. After a little while of this, you start getting foreign rule as well. Egypt spends a little while under the rule of the Libyans. It spends a, a little while under the rule of the Kushites, who live in modern-day Sudan. Uh, it gets conquered by the Assyrians for a couple of decades. It gets conquered by the Persians for a couple of decades. They liberate themselves in a rebellion. The Persians conquer them again. 10 years before Alexander, and then Alexander the Great takes it over. And then after that, a succession of foreigners rules Egypt, and the next native-born Egyptian to rule Egypt after Nectanebo II, who ruled, I don't know, I want to say 350 BCE-ish, uh, was Nasser in the 1950s. And then you have the Ptolemaic period, which is the rule by the Greeks and all that, which we don't really need to get into. We divide the Egyptian language into about five stages. There are other writing systems that you'll hear about, things like hieratic that we're not discussing here. Old Egyptian was the language of the Old Kingdom and immediately prior. It continues a little bit in the first intermediate period. Uh, this is We're not learning it because evidence is a little bit more scant, but this is still well attested enough that dictionaries do at least somewhat exist of it. You could make a reasonable effort at writing a grammar of Old Egyptian. There are, of course, prior stages of the language, but we simply do not know them. They're, they weren't written down and have been lost to us. We're studying Middle Egyptian. Middle Egyptian is a very conservative dialect compared to Old Egyptian. That is to say, not much changed. Uh, that's another advantage of learning Middle Egyptian, is it is sufficient to read an Old Egyptian text, generally speaking. Uh, one of the big changes between the two is that Middle Egyptian lost the letter Z that Old Egyptian had, but very few big changes. Then Late Egyptian is the language of the New Kingdom. It developed from a, a different region than did Middle Egyptian and is quite different from it. Uh, there are a number of features changed, like word order and that kind of thing. It's shifted around quite a bit. Uh, it is something that Egyptology students should eventually learn, but it is not necessarily obligatory. Now, notably, and this is another reason we learn Middle Egyptian, although Late Egyptian was probably spoken by the 18th dynasty, they did most of their writing in Middle Egyptian in order to legitimize themselves as heirs of the Middle Kingdom and tie themselves into that literary language. After the fall of the New Kingdom, 
uh, hieroglyphics get used a little less. And what becomes increasingly common are papyrus records. Originally, papyrus records were written in a kind of cursive hieroglyphic called hieratic. This gets simplified down into a language called demotic, um, which becomes common in like the 7th or 8th century BCE. Demotic is a Greek word, comes from the word for like popular, basically, or of the people, uh, because it was a little more accessible than hieratic. Still similar to hieroglyphics in many respects, but m more cursive, easier to write, that kind of thing. Uh, it was not Greek influenced. Once the Ptolemies came around, the Egyptians were exposed to Greek style writing and they developed the Coptic script. Coptic is a close variant of the Greek alphabet with a few letters added to express sounds present in Egyptian but not in Greek. And then Coptic also describes the whole language after that writing system was invented, which runs from like 200-ish BCE all the way to maybe 1500 when the language finally goes extinct. There is no modern surviving language from Egyptian. Uh, modern Egyptian Arabic, of course, has a few words and expressions it picked up. And the language does survive, Coptic does, in liturgical circles. The Coptic Church occasionally will use it in the same way that the Catholic Church uses Latin, but no one speaks it, no one grows up speaking it. Speaking it. There, is a, there is an active revival effort, so maybe someday the Coptic Christians of Egypt will, will be learning the language from birth again, but outside of Egyptology and the Coptic clergy, knowledge of Egyptian has, has passed from the world. So that's pretty much all we need to cover on Egyptian history and the history of the language. So we're going to jump right into Egyptian in the next video. We're going to start with the alphabet, which is probably going to be a little more complicated than other alphabets you may have learned.